Kus so verigenti? Black Rigteus nes bil jamis bolin. Chapter 3 part 2. Betrayal and obediente. Samuel continued in den Turet Servants where slaves as it has always been since the elfu mojana mia citas. And let's not forget what happened to Libya after the murder of Muammar al-Gaddafi. Slavery applies to any person bugged and sold, chained and abused, whether for a year, a decade or a lifetime. Over the years, many Catilians died long before their indentured services ended. So se uho made it were denied their freedom. Do you think the justice system would have helped them? There was no justice system, no court of law. Uho would back them when their owners failed to deliver on their promises? The Abenians? I don't think so millions of so-called convicts, beggars, homeless and other undesirable Wakatilians were transported to the Americas against her will on slave ships on set that money got got to them. Chose who volunteer did so only because they knew their future in Ireland would be more poverty, disease and oppression from the computants and the abenians because of Anaya, the first. They were stuck on an island with no hair to go, America became their dream. These ships were a repair of the trans-American slave trade. They were so troded and in terrible conditions that many died on their way to the Americas. Even as the ships were docking, they soon learned that living in America would be a battle for survival. Elfumojas of runners usually large groups of greedy men swarmed aboard the ship before they called dock, grabbing them and forcing them to tenement houses. They ten would charge an ultra geos fee for their services. Some of them had to settle in the ports they arrived in, begging on a very straight corner. Samuel paused as he finished his lemonade, but he must say only that the Wakatilians of the Congo who were treated as animals, he mean, they weren't even considered men. Samuel paused again with a strange look and then shook his head, well, those of Ireland who are unfamiliar with plumbing and running water, let alone technology. These living conditions, bread sickness and premature death. They estimated that Sabini Natano Asilimia of all infants born to the Irish Wakatilians immigrants did. They were ridiculed for how they dressed, for being poor, and illiterate. Instead of apologizing for themselves, they soon united and took offense. They often met insult or intimidation with violence. Solidarity was their strength. They helped one another survive this life. They prayed and drank together. The men seemed to do more drinking than praying, yet their fight and determination led them to treat the about first temple of the Americas. It was a militant church, a church that fought not only for their souls, but also for their human rigs. During this time, one of the greatest Wakatilians came on the stene, a boxy gun. Which means will that from the clan of Tablita, the son of Wanyinikevu and Queen Anaya the first. Your grandfather, the man from the other side of Nohere, so me called him. Kush located at Samuel, the other side of Nohere? Samuel just smiled, he will get into that latter. Just know he was a young man around your age when he arrived. But he grew into a man of significant influence who became a reasoning force between all Wakatilians in those parts. She united in destroyed one of the evilest demons there, Bastet. He understood that the computants and the Abenians were the enemies. They were trying to force our people to destroy only another because of geographical locations, faith, skin color and tones, and other idiotic reasons and a boxigun wanted all Wakatilians and the Anakatas united as one. He even saved a few computants in the protests. A boxigun was our ancestor, who was born in Arizona. He knew first and about the separation and destruction of Wakatilians because his father, 
wanyinyikevu, taugti mhis history. Bain the son of Queen Anaya, the first who was half computan and half wakatilian, che nicknamed them half bread or mestizos. And that's how that name came to be. The mestizos were a unified forte, that was an exceptional group of people who were well trained in the art of war treated bis about himself called point the deal or hands of God, but he was also well trained in the art of peace. But this time, many mestizos were wakatilian, anakatas, and even computan mitures and were very well respected and feared in the West. The mestizos were treated when his father, Chaka, was visited by a servant of Sabaoth a few months before his death named Mlezi. Kush interrupted Samuel, before he called finish, Dan Daddy. Samuel said, yes, son, te same one. Kush asks, how old is he? Samuel said, when Sabaoth said, let us treat a man in our image. It was Mlezi and Mshaka, he was speaking to. Kush learned back in his chair, as Samuel continued, Mlezi told Shaka to send Anaya to the Americas rigged before her mother's death to his brother's land where she later married Wanyinikevu. However, it was told to her untle mal that a renegade Abenian murdered her, as they obeyed the word of Sabaoth. Chaka didn't go himself, but sent his bravest warriors to a reservation in the far western part of the Americas in the old town of Tucson, Arizona. It was there she would meet Wanyinikevu, a Wakatilian warrior, a Louisiana prince who came to Arizona seeking the power and glory of Sabaoth. Samuel looked at Kush and saw that his eyes were becoming heavy, that's a nog for to die, and if gotten off track anyway, but get you some rest, and we will continue tomorrow. Kush got up early and did his chores around the house hastily, rushing to get to his grandfather's house. He skipped breakfast because he knew Big Ma always prepared a feast whenever she cooked. He ran to his grandfather's house less than a quarter of a mile until he saw the front door. There was a sick foot hig fence that ran along the pathway. He saw Gemini standing there staring at him. Smiling and waving, good morning Gemini. The horse stomped his hoofs into the ground and shook his head. Kush was excited and smiled as he got closer to his grandfather's door. Samuel's stories were so vivid and clear to Kush, as if he called say the characters in real life and in real time. Knocking on the door, he was met by his little cousins, Cliff, nicknamed Sweets, and Ron, who was a nickname was Bobby Brew. Cliff was five years old and the oldest of the two brothers, but wherever you saw Cliff, you saw Ron running behind him. Cliff had the door cracked open and a delicious aroma came rushing out that had Kush's mouth watering. Ron throws open the door the rest of the way, standing in the middle of the doorway, half-dressed, what you want, said Ron blocking Kush from entering the house. It's Kush, shouted Cliff. Little boy get in here with no clothes on. It was Mama Sok, Big Ma's best friend, grabbing Ron by the hand and moved him out of the way. Good morning Mama Sok. Kush said. Mama Sok smiled, good morning chill. A loud voice came out of the kitchen, sweets. What I done told you about opening that their door? Sok bring that naked ass boy here. I'm so tired of telling that boy the same thing. Hearing Big Ma's voice in a stern voice, was at that door, this time of the morning. Who shouts, morning Big Ma, it seems. Recognizing his voice, Big Ma shouts, oh, hey Kush, he forgot you and Sam were talking. Get Bobby Brew, and you and Sweets come on in and wash up. Breakfast will be ready in about kumi minutes. Samuel was at the table drinking coffee and listening to some recordings, he paused the recording, good morning Kush. Kush smiled, morning Dan Daddy. 
Samuel Smilet back, sit down, and drink a tub of coffee with me. Big ma over here de conversation, Samuel. Don't you give it that boy no coffee. Hell be running around here, like a chicken with its head cut off. Samuel winked at Kush, who she fuss by, he ain't gonna give it that boy no coffee, as he secretly poured a little coffee in his sauter and passed it to Kush, saying, a little coffee ain't never hurt nobody. Samuel smiled at Kush, as he called out, Bobby Bru. Come Mary. Ron came running in, Samuel took a long drag from his favorite King Edward Tigar, that was resting in an ashtray and blowing the smoke into Ron's hair. Your hair is on fire, Bobby Bru look. Samuel said as he showed Ron a small mirror, Ron ran out streaming and logging. Big ma then yelled out, he all come get some teat. A word u said in these parts that meant, some thing to eat. As soon as she spoke to se words, the entire house se made to shake as a trod from out of no hair, came rushing in from a very direction. The youngest sat on the floor with their back against the cabinet, making a path for people to pass through. The oldest sat at the table and Samuel walked out as Big Ma handed him a plate, go get your plate and meet me in my study. Samuel told Kush. Samuel pulls out a stand for Kush to eat on and Kush plated his plate on the stand and said grate. Kush looked at his plate and didn't know where to start. Eggs, bacon, der sausages, grits, homemade biscuits, and a glass of fresh squeezed orange juice. The entire house was quiet, all on a cold hair was the sound of spoons and forks hitting the plates and glasses being plated back on the table or floor. After they ate, Samuel gave Kush his plate, take it as to the kitchen, tell your grandmother, thanks and hurry back. Kush rushed back and took a seat in Samuel's favorite chair as Samuel sat on the small love seat talking for a bit as Everyone had chores to do, from the youngest to the oldest. Their duties included washing the dishes, cleaning the garden, feeding the animals and washing clothes. The eldest home stole the youngest, then Kush said nervously, Dan Daddy, I have that poem for you. Samuel looked up at Kush, you just no telling me. Well, go ahead. Kush smiled, he was waiting for me cousins to get gone. Kush cleared his throat. Got this strong feeling? It feels as if many folks think that God is some big ole giant with a man sitting on a throne. That alone is a hoax, for he is spirit and truth. You got him judging your every move, a heartless man who calls himself God that calls himself love. Me God searches the heart. Me God cradles his love for you. What is the true definition of love? What lie is this? That you've been told, or told you the yes? That's why many don't believe in God. No, they don't believe in him because of this. He got so many good news for ya. That's not the truth for ya. Close your ears. Do it right now. Close your ears. Go back in time when you went over to say, Granddaddy. Papa Joy or old man, hump, you know his name. You know their name is your grandfather. God is like your grandfather. God is like, Granddaddy, Papa Joy, and old man, hump, he loves you. And you fail his love. It's not artificial or gmo. He'll tell you what yourself. Be careful, he'll tell you the truth about yourself, only can no one else. He'll tell you he wouldn't do that if he were you. Or simply, no. If we listen to his voice, of course, God is like your grandfather. The girls get special privileges and rated like queens, you know what I mean. The boys get to do things that the girls can't do, and neither mother nor father has a word to say. Your grandfather is talking, and they are listening. 
God is like a grandfather. You fail to love, you fail to pain from the punishments that you gain. Your grandfather is a God example. It is as plain as can be, as if for you to say, what God's love is meant to be. Cause God is like your grandfather. Dear listener, this is just a note for you, this is the end of chapter tattoo. However, YouTube was only allowing me to upload up to 20 minutes of a chapter, so I divided it into two parts. The team has been extended, so I think for no one, I will try to put an entire chapter instead of divided them. Thank you. Please, if you enjoy my story, please like them or hit the thumbs up on my chapter so I can play more of them on her with. Longer time periods. Thank you again. James Bolin.